Thank you. That's a very flattering introduction. You know, the one thing I have in common with those guys is we're all Germans and we're all cow carbs, I think. <laughs> Never does nature say one thing and wisdom another. There's a guy named Juvenal, who was, I think, a Roman philosopher. Never does wisdom say one thing, or never does nature say one thing and wisdom another. What Ron's referring to, sadly, should not be a discussion that's separate from or different from, or lunchtime discussion in a school of naturopathic medicine. What we're referring to today as nature cure and vitalism is naturopathic medicine. And it's built on a completely different worldview. And it's not only a different worldview, it's a worldview that has been described as, or defined as, vitalism. But it is a worldview that's been out of favor for the last 100 years or more because we have grown up, you have grown up, our culture in the last 100 years has grown up in a mechanistic world, the world of scientific materialism, which skews vitalism. And yet the very principles of vitalism, where there's an interconnected where everything is connected to everything, where there's intelligence and purpose at work, and where we are the physical manifestation of that, is the very subject of the cutting edge of our sciences today. This is a lesson of quantum physics, and astrophysics, and fractal mathematics, and consilience in biology, and so on and so forth. Everything is connected to everything, and our physical universe is only an expression of the higher levels of consciousness. Now, if that's true, that has profound implications to and with the way we approach health and disease. That is antithetical to and diametrically opposed to, this, to the cultural approach to health and healing in our culture. In fact, the two do not meet. There is no place where they meet because they are in parallel universes. Now, some of you, how many of you have heard me talk about this parallel universe thing before? Okay, some of you have to, I've got to make the case that the way you look at something is determined by your worldview or your belief system, the way you have been taught by your culture, your religion, your family of origin to determine what something means. The writers on this subject say over and over again, facts are facts are facts, but facts are never self-interpreting. What something means depends on the context, the worldview, the belief, underlying belief system that you live in. That's your world, that's your paradigm. An example that's used for medical writing, and one of the books that you probably should have read, read but don't know about, is called Divided Legacy, The History of the Schism in Thought in Medicine by Harris Coulter. Divided Legacy, The History of a Schism of Thought in Medicine, Harris Coulter. Coulter says in the introduction exactly what I'm talking about here. A fever is a fever is a fever because you can objectively define fever. That's an example of, of a fact as a fact. But what that means depends on your worldview. And if you live in the mechanistic flat earth world of conventional medicine, a fever can be a problem, and the doctor's job is to stop the fever by turning it off. If you live in the beneficial, wholly integrated, organized world of vitalism, the fever has an adaptive purpose and it should be celebrated and supported. Now we have the same fact, but those facts are diametrically opposed. I mean, that what they mean is diametrically opposed, and therefore, from a physician's point of view, your reaction, or your so-called therapeutic rationale, are at opposite ends of a continuum. 
the conventional doctor wants to stop the fever, the vitalist doctor wants to support the fever, understanding that it's, a, it's again, a beneficial adaptation. And so it is with our world at large. We have a way of understanding the world through the lens of our belief system. One of my personal epiphanies, which has occurred within the last couple of weeks, I talked about, I think, at the gathering here last month, was this. I have just read a series of essays about Darwin's work. And I come to find, if I'm interpreting this correctly, that Charles Darwin was, amongst his contemporaries, was known as a romantic. That is, from the romantic school of philosophy. He might have been a romantic in his personal life, too, I'm not saying that. <laughs> He was, he, as, as was the case with many of his contemporaries, were known in the Romantic School of Philosophy. And he was wholly vitalistic, believing that there was something more at work here than the physical. And he writes about this extensively. He writes about the fact that his observations have shown him without a doubt that there is an intelligent force behind everything and that what we see in the natural world is the, quote, handiwork of God. Now, how does that square with what you and I were told about his book, The Origin of the Species and the Theory of Evolution? We've been told exactly the opposite. We've been told that it's a wholly mechanistic way of explaining how species evolve, and it has nothing whatever to do with any kind of higher power or interconnectedness to a universe. In fact, we're at the point where the theory of evolution and, uh, and uh, the uh, religious right have been at war at least since the time of the Skull Monkey Trial in 1929. Because it's been perceived in that way. It turns out that Darwin wasn't writing that at all. At least according to these essays that I've just read. Darwin instead was observing the fact that in the closed laboratory of the Galapagos Islands, he was witnessing this phenomenal event where the species there were interacting together in a way that all benefited each other in a way that was in the best interest of each species. Holy cow! How do we get from there to the current theory of evolution? Well, what I'm thinking now is because the people who read The Origin of the Species and told us what it said were people who were reading it through the lens of scientific materialism and carefully edited that out, maybe not consciously, but simply because their worldview did not allow for that possibility. Are you with me on that? And that ain't no small matter, folks. Think about that. Think about the lesson there. The theory of evolution has been invoked to, uh, as interpreted by the scientific materialist, has been invoked to explain everything in our culture, especially capitalism. The message of Darwinism is, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? It's all right to climb to the top. Survival of the fittest, you know? If you're not stronger, more aggressive, and more obnoxious than the next guy, you're not going to make it. That's not what he was saying. Imagine if this was interpreted for us through the lens of the folks who understood Bibleism, where they tell us that we're all in this together, all species are working together with and for each other for the best outcome for all. Darwin actually uses the word in his writings, this is an altruistic phenomenon. Imagine if we learned it that way. How would that have changed our culture? How would that have changed our lives? How would that have changed what we think of as our economic system? That same phenomenon is at work in medicine. The medicine that's practiced in this culture is a wholly materialistic, reductionistic, flat earth medicine that does not understand the interconnectedness of all, the fact that the physical is an expression of something else, and that the universe is an organized, intelligent, and friendly place. Now some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. 
And I understand why. Because you're living in a different world. Because if you're in the first paradigm of materialism, or to talk quickly about how scholars have looked at this, we'll use the flat earth, round earth. Some of you are so tired of me saying this, you're sick of it, but I can do it anyway, because some of you probably haven't heard of it. We were told that sometime in our history, we thought the world was flat. And then we learned that the world is round. And these are representations of what you call a paradigm. People believed the world was flat because, in fact, their experience taught them it was flat. See, when, when, you're, when you're analyzing what's happening by as far as you can walk or, or, or ride a horse in a day, the earth is flat for all practical purposes. And only when you gather more information by increased technology or increasing experiences where you start to have information that calls into question the, the fact that the earth is flat because it doesn't make sense that blah, 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 unless we think of it being this way. You see, you, get to, you start to have experiences of something that make you want to question the reality of what you already believe or the limits of your belief system. When you reach that point, you have two options. You either throw away the information because it doesn't fit with your world model or your world view, or you change the worldview. And in that case, you're, told, you're said to have changed your paradigm, or your worldview, or your way of understanding stuff, or more to the point, your belief system. So the flat earth, round earth is used classically in some of the books that have been written about this. This has been examined over and over by the academics, this idea about the paradigm shift. In fact, I should tell you parenthetically, its relevance to medicine and to our culture is this that the difference, the scholars who look at medicine, back to culture and the divided legacy, which I just talked about, and others who have looked at this, will tell you, if you look at the history of science as it was developed in the West, you cannot find a linear development of ideas, which we were all taught. Right? We're all taught we went from A to B to C to D, and we built on this rich history of intellectual inquiry. Nothing of the kind can be demonstrated, according to the scholars who have looked at this. Instead, what they say is, you go from A to B to C to D in a linear way until you reach a point where you can no longer make any sense of the world based on your, on your current belief system. Then you have to change the system to accommodate the new information. That's a shift. That's a paradigm shift. And then for, in the new paradigm, you go on in a linear way of, 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 of understanding your world. But once again, you're going to hit the wall. And that wall is your belief system. Now back to the flat earth, round earth thing. If you understand that the world is flat, and you start having experiences that suggest to you that something else might be afoot, you can only deal with that in a personal level in two ways. I didn't really see that. That really didn't happen. That can't be true. Or you say to yourself, uh, maybe I have to think about this differently. Maybe I have to look at this in a different way. When, when you allow the different way to be part of your reality, you are changing your paradigm. That happens on a personal level, and then it also will happen on a cultural level. Now, um, This is a very, very important point, and it is extremely profound, because these two paradigms don't meet. And this is for a very simple reason, according to the people who have studied this. If you understand that the world is flat, and this, by the way, is a lecture or an hour or two by itself, so I'm racing through this to make the point, so you know where I'm coming from. If you understand that the world is flat, and now you come to know that the world is round, then obviously you know that the world is flat because you've been there and done that, right? If you can see the world this way and now you can see it this way, then obviously you can see it that way. Everybody with me on that? Okay? But if you're over here in this paradigm and you can't understand this paradigm, you can't understand it because if you could, you would. It's a wholly one-way street. 
In other words, those who are capable of making the leap or the change or the change in their beliefs to embrace a new paradigm obviously can understand the old paradigm, but those who are in the old paradigm can't understand the new paradigm because if they could, they would. Right? <clears throat> this is why you can't talk to a medical doctor. This is why you can't talk to spouses and friends who are trapped in the flat earth of conventional medicine because it's based on a completely different assumption about how the universe works and what health and disease is and what the physician's role is. When you're in this other paradigm and you look back at conventional medicine, you have to slap your forehead like that, like what, like what? Like, are you kidding me? We just had some examples in class this morning. I have a four-month-old patient, four-month-old baby boy who spits up when he eats. Guess what they give him? Anybody? PPI, proton pump inhibitors. You go, what? What? That's the best the 21st century medicine has to offer a child who's throwing up after he eats? When I say to the parents, the mother, do you know how to birth the baby? And she says, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. I, I lost it. I lost it. You mean to tell me that your pediatrician put this child on a medicine with serious side effects and never talked to you about how to birth the baby? Or what he's eating? Why? Because it's a standard of care. I was driving around the valley yesterday and heard this ad from Mayo Clinic. We got this team of all these experts will help figure out what's going on with you, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, they'll figure out what's wrong with you and then they'll give you what? Steroids or antibiotics or chemotherapy. <laughs> what else have they got, right? My point is when you're over here in this other world and you look back at conventional medicine, it doesn't make any sense. It simply doesn't make any sense. Now, some of you think that I'm heretical in saying this and that's fine because I don't really care. And some of you think I'm a little off my court here. But let's look at evidence-based medicine. Where's the evidence? Number one most expensive medical system in the world with the lousiest outcomes. We have the shortest life expectancy, the highest infant mortality rates in the developed world, and we are, according to the World Health Organization, the 92nd, that's a 9 and a 2, the 92nd healthiest nation out of 191 nations. You want evidence? There's evidence. <laughs> I have had 35 years of practice under my belt, and I've had more patients than you can shake a stick at, who go to Mayo or some of the other big name places, and they get these workups, tens of thousands of dollars with every possible imaging you can think of, but then there's nothing to offer except for steroids or antibiotics or maybe some kind of anti-inflammatory drug, but the big ones now are immunosuppressive medication. Oh, by the way, anybody here in my class? You might need to talk about that tomorrow. So this is a completely different universe. It's a completely different way of understanding medicine. It's a completely different way of intervening because it requires, once you understand it, a completely different therapeutic rationale. Never does nature say one thing and wisdom another. It's normal to be healthy. And when you're not healthy, when you're out of balance, there are adaptations that occur in a living system, and those adaptations are what we call disease in our culture. There's nothing pathogenic or pathological about it. There's a wholly predictable adaptation to the living system that's under stress, and the only way to eliminate the symptoms is to restore normal. Period. The end. Not to treat the symptom. A good nature of having a doctor is always, 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 always realizing that whatever you're looking at is not what you're looking at. The headache is never, a migraine is never a headache. The back pain is never back pain. The digestive problems are never digestive problems. They're always coming from something else. They're always from something else that's out of balance. And what you're going to do is restore balance. Well, how do you do that? You use methods that do that. And what are those? Changes in diet, physical medicine, acupuncture, homeopathy. All of the modalities that we study in naturopathic medicine are calculated to restore normal 
or to restore normal function and normal structure. When you do that, everything gets better because everything is connected to everything. Physical medicine is not just physical medicine. Physical medicine affects the whole body. Homeopathic interventions affect the whole body. Dietary changes affect the whole body, and so on and so forth. So you are, some of you may not want to hear this, and some of you are dying to hear this, you are being prepared, if you're paying attention, to be the best physicians in the world. Particularly these days, when the only thing allopathic medicine has to offer anymore is more and more drugs. In fact, a narrower and narrower group of drugs. When you're being taught to think this through and help to restore normal function. One of the things we're doing in a senior class is I would say, pick any problem, anything you can think of, tell me what is going to happen in conventional medicine, because everybody knows what is going to happen when you go to the medical doctor, and then tell me what you have to do. What would you do? And you will know right away, even if you're in your first year, you may know right away that you've got a list of possible interventions that are at least somewhat challenging to that other point of view. I'm going to give you one example real quickly here where I have a woman who's working with me, uh, who's been with me for seven or eight years, started as a resident. On her first rotation with an allopathic doctor, she was in a neurologist's office, and she was told by the neurologist, some of you have heard this story, she was told by the neurologist on the first day, here's how this is going to work. You can come in the room with me. I want you to sit in the back there, and I don't want you to say anything. I will take the history, and I'll do a physical exam, and then you and I will step out of the room, and we'll discuss what, what we'll answer any questions that you might have. First patient comes in, starts complaining about migraine, and the guy no sooner than takes the history and looks at her. Now, mind you, he just told her to shut up, not offer anything, and step outside with any questions that you may have. He takes this history of migraine, he turns to her, and he says, what would you do, doctor? And she's thinking, oh my God, he just told me to shut up. He just told me not to say anything. Now she's thinking, well, maybe he's legitimately wanting to know what I would do to treat a migraine. Now she's two months uh, out of SCNF. Never practiced clinically in her life except what she saw here in the student clinic. And she starts saying to this neurologist who just asked the question, well, uh, uh, I guess I want to know more about his diet. I want to know if he's got specific food sensitivities, got an adequate amount of protein and amino acids and fatty acids. I might be concerned about muscle spasms, I guess acupuncture, maybe massage, trigger point therapy, manipulation of the spine. Um, I, I guess we could find a homeopathic remedy that might be helpful for, you know, based on his description of his problem. And she goes on and on and on and on. And he looks at her and says, if you ever embarrass me like that again in front of a patient, you're out of here. I just tell my first year, my fourth year class, the lesson that she learned was keep your mouth shut. Right? Because guess what, folks? Anybody in here in allopathic medicine? Anybody want to play? Let's play MD. What does the neurologist have? Neurologist. That's it. End of story. You have my heat. Uh, this is uh, okay. I'm getting off subject. My point is that you have so much more to offer, and you are in, you're, you're, you're being trained in a place where hopefully these principles are understood and emphasized over and over and over and over again. People want doctors who know how to figure out what's going on and then know what to do about it. They are up to here with the drugs. This country is 5% of the world's population. We consume 50% of the drugs that are manufactured. 50% of all the drugs are eaten by Americans. The other 50% is for the remaining 95% of the world's population and agriculture. 
If there's a direct correlation between the use of drugs and our health, it's an inverse one. So anyway, it's, and I think this is the expression that Ron was picking up. I don't remember doing that, but I can imagine doing that when he talked to me. And that is that the fact that we're talking about vitalism and nature cure as though it's some kind of separate you know, subset of naturopathic medicine makes me sick to my stomach because it is the foundation of what we call naturopathic medicine. Now, does this mean you don't use drugs and you don't use pharmaceuticals? No. There's a time and a place. There's a time and a place to turn off the symptoms or suppress the symptoms. And that's when they're life-threatening. But that's the only time. Because for a well-educated physician, the symptoms are the, in the words of Hippocrates, the language of the disease. The symptoms tell you what the body is trying to do to correct the problem. So I go back to the fever. If somebody has a fever, this is an intelligent, predictable reaction on the part of the living system that needs your support as a physician. Your turning that off is interrupting, interfering with, antithetical to what nature in her wisdom is trying to do. Paracelsus probably said it best 500 years ago where he said, nature knows her business better than we. Therefore, it behooves the physician to follow the will of nature. He also made a comment slightly different from that, where he said, the physician is the servant of nature, not her master. And you see that dichotomy in our current culture, where there's this sense in the scientific materialistic approach to medicine that somehow we can do better than the natural world. We can figure out through genetic engineering or whatever else how to do better what Paracelsus would say has already been done perfectly by Mother Nature herself. So you can be in a position if you're grounded in these basic ideas where always, always, always what you're doing is giving the body what it needs to function properly, removing the obstacles to the cure in the language of our predecessors, and making sure there's enough energy there to do that. That's all there is. That's all there is. You do that, you can be assured that things are gonna work out because there's a force at work in the human body and in all living systems that we refer to as the vital force that's always working towards normal function and structure. And <coughs> the physician's only job is to provide the environment where that can occur. And then, you know, you give the body what it needs, you take out the garbage, you get enough uh, uh, energy in there, you just like, get out of the way, right? The corollary to that, of course, is, as you may know, when you get in the way, when you suppress the symptom, when you do not allow their full expression, you are said to have suppressed the illness, driving it deeper. I don't know if you've talked about this yet or not, and I know you're in all different classes, but the suppression of illness by interrupting a symptom not only ignores the underlying problem, it requires it to go deeper and find another outlet. And if you understand the doctrine of suppression, as I just described it, you will understand why we are the sickest nation on earth when it comes to chronic disease. Our chronic disease rate and the amount of sickness that we have is directly proportional to intervention with pharmaceuticals to interrupt or suppress the symptoms from an allopathic point of view. So I started that paragraph or that rant there by saying that if you can learn not to treat disease and not to treat by protocol, See, you don't treat diseases because there are no diseases. There are only the adaptations that occur in the living system as it moves off balance. No two people ever have the same problem, in spite of the fact that in conventional medicine we give these things names. That name applies to only one symptom that somebody has. In totality, everybody's completely different from everybody else. And so, just as Florence Nightingale said, the idea that there are and there are diseases as individual entities is absurd on the face of it because there are only the changes that occur on the individual. And if you understand that simple principle and you use the methods 
of vitalism to restore normal, then you're going to be very successful, I think, compared especially to the dominant school, which has very little to offer except, again, the suppression of the symptoms. That puts you in a position of being the physicians that the public is looking for. And they don't even know it because they don't know you exist. They don't know what you do. One of the reasons they don't know what you do is that most of us don't know what we do. We have all kinds of ways to explain naturopathy and nobody is doing it, not nobody, but very few people are doing it in the way that it's been traditionally taught by treating the person, not the disease. I can't tell you how many people I've seen over the years who say, where have you been all my life? And I've been right here. Right? <laughs> I never heard about nature and medicine. People know, and I'll tell you what, the so-called Affordable Care Act is, is stirring it up even more from a, a public <coughs> revulsion point of view. People have had it up to here with medicine. They're paying more and more and more and more and getting less and less and less and less. So broken is the system. So bad is the product that the federal government now has to mandate that you buy a product that you don't want in order to keep the system from going broke, right? And it's only going to make it worse. The answer to our medical problem is not more of the same. In fact, that's the definition of insanity, right? <laughs> keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. How is that going to work, right? The demand for your services as a competent physician who knows how to heal people is going to go through the roof thanks to the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. But you have to know what you're doing. And if you're imitating, you know, when I uh, <coughs> was talking to one of my associates about what I should talk about, what she said was, well, why don't you just say this? Never, never, never try to be a medical doctor. <laughs> if you're going to practice the way, if, you, if your practice is uh, 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 an imitation of what's happening in conventional medicine. How, think about that for a minute. How's that going to work? We already know that the system doesn't work. So how are you going to make that better? The way you're going to make it better is you're going to leave that behind and you're going to come over to the world of vitalism and this parallel universe. And those of you who have been in this parallel universe will know it's a lonely place. See, when you change paradigms, the first person who changes paradigms gets sent to the funny farm. They get excommunicated from the church. They get burned at the stake. History is full of this. You all know these people. Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, probably in every society. I don't know if other societies are less tolerant than our own, but I'm guessing that every society has its um, it's a well-known person who's on the, quote, cutting edge now, but at the time, they were ridiculed, they lost their grant money, they had their uh, reputation ruined, or whatever it was, because they saw things differently. And then sooner or later, other people start to see them differently. Well, at this time, when conventional medicine is taken like a gospel, when it's, when it's, when it's consumed like a religion, when there's no critical thinking involved whatsoever, when people buy what they're being taught by the dominant school of medicine, and you're questioning that, and you're thinking differently, and you're living in a different world, believe me, it's a lonely place. It's really hard to explain to other people why you believe what you're doing, or what you, when you're doing what you're doing. But what choice do you have? I'm going to guess that most of you are here because you want to do that. Because if you want it to be like more of the same, there are a hundred and how many other medical schools that could help you with that. I did a lecture for the now third year class and their friends and family on this very thing, on this why you can't talk to your spouse or your loved one about naturopathic medicine because they're living in a different world. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me afterwards and said, oh my god, thank you, I finally understand why I'm crazy or why my friends think I'm crazy. So, I guess the point, in spite of what it looks like when you're sitting in that first year, or second, or even third, or fourth year, when you're being offered 
the medical sciences in a way that suggests to you that you couldn't possibly have anything to offer beyond what's out there. When you compare yourself to all that can possibly be known and think that, how can I meet that standard? How can I do what they're, what they're doing? I'm going to tell you that if you follow the basic principles, you see, you don't have to know everything, because you never will. And you don't have to know everything about every disease state. You have to know about the basic principles. It's this simple. A couple of weeks ago, I was lecturing in New Hampshire. I was talking to somebody the day before. And she said, this woman is, this woman is at a, one of the exhibitor booths. And I happen to know her because she's a representative in my area for a certain product. So we're chatting away, and she said, I hear you're going to speak tomorrow. I said, yeah, what are you going to talk about? I'm going to talk about, I told her, just this. Right? I said, I'm going to talk about how the way to have stellar, repeatable, clinical success is to stick with some simple, basic principles and not get caught up in the details of scientific materials. And she says, that's just like my cat, Louie. I go, what? <laughs> Louie is a nature path? <laughs> no. Okay, so I give up. What happened to Louie? Louie's been losing his fur on his tail and on his hindquarter. Here, let me show you a picture. She pulls out her, like everybody has their pictures these days, right? She pulls out the picture and she goes, it's a big, fat, orange cat <laughs> sitting next to a pumpkin. <laughs> she says, no smart remarks. I said, I wasn't going to say anything. She said, yes, you were. You were going to say, which one's the pumpkin? <laughs> no, I can tell Louie. Louie's the one without the hair. Right? She takes the cat to a vet. And the vet says, Louie's losing his hair because he's depressed. Because there's a dog in the house. He needs to be on antidepressants. Now, this is thinking like a medical doctor, right, in the extreme, of course. She says she's using transdermal amitriptyline on this cat for a couple of days. And by the third day or so, she says to herself, what am I doing? This is completely antithetical to everything I believe. So she looks up a holistic vet, some drive for her. This is in the Boston area, so it's a little bit of a trick for her to find this holistic vet. She looks up the holistic vet, she goes to the vet, she says, the vet doesn't say a word other than knowing that Louis is losing his hair. The vet puts a cat on a table and starts combing the hair and looks at her and says, what do you feed this cat? And she names a brand of cat food, which I don't know, because I don't know anything about cat food. But the vet looks at her and says, cats don't hunt grains, they hunt animals. Change the food to such and so. So she changes to an uh, animal protein based diet. And within two or three weeks, Louis is fine and presumably no longer depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, now I get it. That's naturopathy, right? We don't treat the symptom, we treat the underlying cause. And one of the things that you find, and this happens all the time, how many of you have preceptor with me? Are there any, anyone here? Susan? Okay. One of the things we see, we find ourselves saying to each other sometimes after we're explaining something to ourselves or a student is, that didn't look like rocket science. I mean, just using a homeopathic remedy? But see what I just said there, just using a homeopathic remedy? Or just adjusting their neck? Or just giving them the animal-based uh, cat food instead of grain food? That doesn't sound like rocket scientists. Well, you know what? It's more than the conventional system has to offer right now. The best medical system in the world can't go there. The woman I mentioned before says to a gastroenterologist where she is doing a rotation one time, she says, doctor, would you ever consider using probiotics 
for somebody who has irritable bowel syndrome. And the guy says, there's no research on that. And her response was, doctor, we're not talking rocket science. We're talking basic science. You know, there's a, there's a level almost of disbelief here that the people who hold themselves out to be the experts in human digestion don't know that there's normal commensal organisms in the human digestive tract. Hello? It's not bad, folks. But my point is that you are in a place where if you're paying attention, you're getting the right philosophical discussion that underpins all this, you will realize that you are easily easily be in a place to be the most effective and the most competent physicians in our culture in just the next couple of years. And I admire you for making the commitment to do that, and I hope that your life is blessed with all of the excitement and joy that this kind of profession can bring to you. Thank you. In that case, does anybody have a question? Yes, sir. There will be a good view of both the conventional and traditional natural ideas. It seems that the way they explain it, it seems that the conventional or just medicine is a little bit more exclusive of any outside ideas. And we try to, as an advocate, a multitude of ideas. Are there any points where naturopathic medicine and conventional MD medicine are mutually exclusive to each other? Mutually exclusive? Yes. They are mutually exclusive. You're asking if they're mutually exclusive. No, no, exclusive. Yeah, they're a totally different world. They're totally, totally different world. Here, I'll give you another example. I have a resident in my office. She calls me. Uh, she calls me out of my uh, treatment space. As I'm seeing this is a woman who graduated from Southwest. She sees one of her first patients with us. <coughs> she has a three-year-old boy who's got a fever, a, a, a cough, a cough was in the The patient came in because mom said he has a cough. She examines the kid, and the kid has a fever, he's coughing, and what she called funky lungs. That's not exactly a medical term. I was expecting something else like inspiratory rod or something, but funky lungs, right? She said, I think this kid has pneumonia. Well, let's find out. So I go and examine the kid. We step out and say, he's got pneumonia. What do you want to do? The first thing she said was, chest x-ray and antibiotics. What? Chest x-ray and antibiotics? Why would you do that? Wasn't that the standard of care? Yeah, if you're a medical doctor. It's not your standard of care. What are you going to do? So we gave that child a homeopathic remedy and a few other things. And that child was 85% better the next day, right? And it illustrates two points. Why would I practice at this standard? First of all, antibiotics are not going to cure that. Antibiotics are going to kill bacteria. They kill good bacteria as well as bad bacteria, actually putting the child in a worse situation from a natural immunity point of view. Secondly, I've got tools that are superior to that. I have tools that can turn that around overnight, right? Now, if you don't see that, and you don't have that model for you, then obviously you're not going to know that. Those are antithetical. If I'm standing in an ER with a child who's got pneumonia, now maybe we want to prove it to ourselves by doing a chest x-ray, but why would we do that? Because it's not going to change the outcome or what I do anyway. But let's say we do an x-ray and we both agree, Mr. MD agrees with me that this child has pneumonia. The only thing he's got is antibiotics. And I've got all kinds of other stuff, right? And my kid with pneumonia is going to be better tomorrow or in a couple of days, and his is going to linger for a couple of, a couple of weeks. The point, though, from your question, what I'm also discerning is that you haven't been uh, shown in sufficient depth what these different what the differences are. It's not just that one group is more inclusive and another is less inclusive. It has to do with 
this is why in the original curriculum we have 40 hours of philosophy throughout the four years, including every year. This whole thing, there's, there's another point I want to make that's a whole lecture, but I'm going to do it in about one minute. Why do you go to a doctor? What is the purpose of seeing a doctor? Well, why would anybody go to a doctor? Or more obvious, from your point of view, why would anybody consult you? What in the world are you going to do? What is the purpose of the intervention? Poneman tells us there's one and only one purpose, to restore the sick to health. Not to treat the disease, but to restore the sick to health. Because when you restore the sick to health, you have eliminated the adaptations that we call the disease. See, when I gave that kid a homeopathic remedy, when she gave that kid a homeopathic remedy for the pneumonia, she wasn't treating pneumonia. She was treating the kid, the whole kid. Because there's no remedy for pneumonia. But there are lots of different remedies for patients who might have pneumonia. Right? She had to choose the right remedy based on that kid's entire presentation. So this gets down to what we call the therapeutic rationale. This is a bottom line in medicine. Pellegrino, who's a well-known uh, uh, writer in medical philosophy, says that what a doctor thinks disease is determines what he or she will do. And so if you think disease is something gone wrong, something problematic, something pathological, then your therapeutic rationale is thinking about how can you stop it? Because that's a problem. That's why every drug category in allopathic medicine starts with A-N-T-I. Antibiotic, antiphlogistic, antiemetic, anti-inflammatory, anti, 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 anti. Pull out a medical dictionary. The 200 entries with anti, because the drugs are working against the symptom on the assumption that the symptoms are the problem and they need to be eliminated. In the vitalist world, where we have an intelligent, predictable, smart, orderly universe, the symptoms are not the problem. They are an adaptation to an underlying ch uh, uh, change. The cholesterol is up because something's out of balance. The back is hurting because there's something out of alignment. The person that has had migraines because there's something going on beyond. The migraine's not in the head. The pain is in the head. There's something else going on. If those symptoms are the adaptation to something else, then the only logical therapeutic intervention is to correct the something else. Not to just give somebody the neurotin for the headache, but to correct the problem. But it goes further than that. In the acute illness, we see the symptoms as beneficial, as an intelligent reaction on the part of the body. Inflammation, fever, sweating, coughing, diarrhea. These are adaptive mechanisms to help the body repair and cleanse itself. No physician who has his head on straight would want to interrupt that because we'd be delaying the, we'd delay the return to normal or the restoration of health. This is why there's no cure for the common cold. The common cold is the cure. So the difference between what's happening in conventional medicine and, you know, somebody said to me the other day, I understand you don't like medical doctors. I don't know if that's true, although I don't think I'd marry one. <laughs> I'm talking about a system that has, if, the, if anybody doesn't believe it, we'll, we'll, we'll duke it out outside. This system has failed us at every turn. There is nothing that you can point to in conventional medicine that looks like it's a benefit. Except, except, the technological interventions that have come with it. Right? But that's not medicine. That's technology. When somebody tells you about an advancement in medicine, they're talking about a technological advancement. You know, laser surgery or whatever you want to talk about, you know, or CAT scan guided this or that. The therapeutic rationale remains the same for the last 2,000 years. 
There have been no improvements in the way they treat anything. There only have been stronger and stronger and stronger medications for the purpose of stopping the symptoms. Now, traditionally, in all cultures, there's a difference between a physician and a surgeon. You've seen that in writing. You've seen things called the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Because physicians and surgeons are not the same thing. The surgeon is the guy who does the mechanical side of it, right? He's the guy who puts you back together after you got, you know, stampeded by the mammoth or whatever. The humans and mammoths were around at the same time. Right? He's the guy who, she's the woman who puts you together after you run over the, by the bus. Or, you know, whatever. And it is the surgical procedures that we're talking about today, you know, with laparoscopic gallbladder and laser guided this and that. That's really surgery. That's not medicine. When we talk about the therapeutic rationale of medicine, it's been the same for the last thousand, several millennia, based on the assumption, the worldview, the belief that the symptoms are the problem. That's the force or hope where they can overcome that. And that's considered, that's okay. I mean, folks, 21st century, that's the best we've got? Are you kidding me? Whereas in this world over here, that makes no sense whatsoever. It has no place in the practice of a rational medicine. Because when a person is healthy, they're not sick. When you can bring somebody back to normal as far as they're able to go, when you have someone whose immune system and their natural defenses are working properly, they ain't gonna have cancer. Why can't your own cells and your own immune system fight off the cancer? And of course they can. But that's not something we talk about in this culture. In fact, it's something that's suppressed. And the people who do it go to jail, get run out of the country, have their licenses taken. And yet, the very people who are doing that, it reminds me of a story. Uh, years ago, I had a patient who was a pediatrician at a world famous medical school that won't read it starts with a Y. And <laughs> this is a pediatrician. She's bringing her kids to me. And I say to her, when I get to know her well enough, you're a pediatrician at one of the best known medical schools in the world. And you're bringing your kids to me. Why? Oh, I couldn't do to other people's children what I'm expected. I couldn't do to my children what I'm expected to do to other people's children. My dear, you have a serious ethical dilemma. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a known fact that most oncologists won't. They won't. They won't even. They wouldn't do their own therapy. What is that time? It tells you a lot. Okay, I guess there's another class in here.